Mother's Day to Mother's Day. I hope you're going to get spoiled uh, because you deserve it. And um, sorry about the gremlins on the screen. It just seems like we're having some mice in the system. So um, maybe just ignore that and just focus on uh, God's word to you. Let me pray and then we'll get stuck into uh, Galatians chapter 3, which is all about Mother's Day. opportunity to celebrate mums um, and we thank you for human relationships we thank you for the power of human relationships we thank you that you have made us for relationship uh, not only with each other but of course in such a wonderful way with you and so heavenly father as we come to your scriptures now we do ask that you would help us through the power of your spirit understand what the word says and as we understand uh, the majesty of the word as it is revealed through the Spirit, that you are our Heavenly Father, and we belong to you, and we are part of your family, and what a privilege that is to be a part of your family. Father, might that enrich our lives this morning, we pray, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I love my mum. I am one of four children, the youngest of four children. Uh, Mum has had two marriages, the first marriage... Um, Her her husband died in a car accident when she was six months pregnant with me and had three other kids in nappies. And then she remarried uh, an Englishman. So my mum's surname is not my surname. My mum's surname is Smith, and I am Swanepoel. So I love Mrs. Smith, who's my mum. Anyway, and uh, uh, she um, lived with that gentleman until he retired. He, He was my kind of uh, father, it's the only father I kind of knew, uh, a good man to her. And then um, just as they were entering retirement or getting ready for retirement, he dies of a massive heart attack. And uh, so she's left alone and she's been alone ever since. Uh, but when I think about my mom, I think about a woman who is solid, secure, steadfast, a rock, um, fair, hard, fair, um, and in her old age, she wouldn't mind me saying this if she, if she was watching. Uh, anyway, uh, in her old age, she's become more tender and loving and affectionate. Um, and, it, and just when I think about mum, I will call her this afternoon, by the way, if you were just checking. Um, I've got to wait for her to wake up. Uh, but just my, my experience as a child, despite all those uh, things within the context of our family and home and life, I, I have a very pleasant childhood memory of growing up in South Africa in a secure, loving home uh, with a loving, caring mum. And for me, as a Swanepoel, that is an absolute privilege. So I see myself belonging to that group of people, the Swanepoels, and I say, what a privilege it is to be a Swanepoel. People often ask me, is Candace related to you? And I say, yeah, of course she is in some kind of, you, you don't know who Candace is? Oh, goodness me. Candace Swanepoel is one of the most beautiful models uh, in the world, and she gets her looks from me. Uh, anyway, we're not related. Uh, <laughs> so so we, when I think about Mother's Day and, and my mum and my relationship with my mum, I think, what a privilege um, to have been r- raised by that woman. What a privilege to be part of that household, that family. But there's a second thing that I'm reminded of when I think about my mum, is not only the privilege, but the responsibility that comes with that privilege. The responsibility of being part of the Swanepoel clan. Uh, I would often recall coming home and saying, mum, so-and-so does this in their home. Ever done that? And uh, she would always respond very quickly, I don't care what they do in their home, in our home we do this, right? Uh, you, you've had that conversation, you've said that to your children, yeah. Uh, and so there's a sense in which with privilege comes responsibility, a responsible way of living uh, as part of this clan, this people, this community. What's that got to do with Galatians chapter 3? Well, as I reflected on it, I thought, in essence, that's exactly what Paul is saying to the Gentiles. Uh, He is saying to them, 
are you children of God? If you look at the passage, that's a question he raises. Are you children of God? And if you are children of God, how did you become children of God? And what does it mean to be children of God? That's his challenge to these Gentile people. Why? Because they're drifting away from their foundational principles, their roots, right? They think they can become children of God by following some sort of ritual practice that was practiced by the Jews. Whereas Paul actually writes to them and says to them quite clearly, don't be fools. (laughs) This is how you became children of God. He says, how you become children of God is that you received the Spirit from God. How did you receive the Spirit from God? You received the Spirit from God by believing in what you heard. What is it that you believe in? What is it that you actually heard? Paul says to them, you heard the story about Jesus. You heard the story about that Jesus is the Son of God, the Son of God who came to earth, who lived on earth, gave his life as a ransom for many, for all of humanity. He died on a cross to deal with sin and death, and then he rose again, and by rising again, he, he conquered death and said to the people of God, put your trust in me, believe in me. And Paul says, this is how you became part of the family of God. This is how you became children of God. This is how you inherited eternal life. You simply believed the story. You believed the promise. You get it? You believed the story about Jesus. That's how you became a child of God. And now he spins it on its head and he says, And that's exactly how the Israelites became the children of God. They actually became the children of God in the exact same way, by simply believing the promises of God. Not by obeying a bunch of rules and laws. No, no. They became the children of God by believing the promise of God. And that's why uh, Paul says here in Galatians that we, as children of God, are actually children of Abraham. We come from the same family tree. This is how he expresses it. Listen, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning by means of the Spirit? Are you now trying to finish by means of flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? So again I ask, does God give you his Spirit and work miracles among you by works of the law or by believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So, who knows their Old Testament uh, uh, stories, uh, or at least their Old Testament Bible. You see, here's the problem that often we do as Christians. We try to drive some kind of wedge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. We say, the Old Testament people, um, yes, I'm not sure about them. They lived under some other kind of covenant, and that covenant doesn't really apply to us today. And so, even the principles don't apply to us. There's really nothing we can learn from the Old Testament and the Old Testament people. We are completely new people because we're actually under a new covenant, right? But that's not right. That's not what Paul is saying. Here's what Paul is saying He's saying, under Abraham, Abraham came to faith came to be a child of God in the exact same way you came to be a child of God. The problem is, over a period of 2,000 years or 800 years, the Israelites got their story wrong. They added a whole bunch of laws and rituals and practices and believed in those rituals and laws and practices, right? And they believed by pursuing those laws and religious practices... That's what made them children of God. Ever fallen into that same trap as a Christian community in the 21st century? 
when you think about your Christian journey, you think about your Christian life, are there certain things you long for and look for and say, this is part of our tradition. We always used to do these kind of things. This is what it means to be a Christian, that we sing these kind of songs or that we have a format in this kind of way or that we uh, do morning tea in this particular... Yeah? Don't make the mistake of understanding what it is that makes you part of the family of God, children of God. It's the same thing that made Abraham a member of the family of God, a child of God. Let me take you back to Genesis chapter three, uh, Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 and 3, 1 to 3. Because this is what Paul is actually quoting. When he's saying, This is how Abraham became a child of God. When he says, We are children of Abraham because we have the same faith as Abraham. This is what he's talking about. Let me read it to you. Uh, In Genesis chapter 12, um, this is what happens. The Lord said to Abram, go from here, from your country, your people and your father's household to a land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great. And you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all people on earth will be blessed through you. That is the covenantal promise that God makes to one man. One man and his wife. And what is significant about this one man and his wife? Anybody remember? She is barren. She cannot have any children. And God makes an unbelievable promise to Abraham. He says to Abraham, leave your family and your household and I will take you to a promised land. And in that promised land, I will turn you into a great multitude of people. And in that land, I will bless you I won't only bless you, but I'll bless all the nations of the world through you. What is the promise that God has made to this one man, Abraham? He's made a promise of land, he's made a promise of descendants, and he's made a promise to bless the nations through him. And what does Abraham do? He believes. He simply puts his faith in the promises of God. And here's what Paul says. At that very moment, God has preached the gospel, the gospel that you and I know, the gospel to Abraham, that through this one descendant, because of his faith, God declares him to be righteous. And that righteousness will extend until the day of the Lord Jesus Christ and then extend to all who will put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that? That's how we are children of Abraham. That's how we belong to this covenant. That is how the covenant from the very outset is proclaimed and extended into the new. It's one continuous story. It's not like God started one story, worked out, now this is not going right, and then changed his mind and went in a different direction. No, the gospel was preached to Abraham in the very beginning. And God said it would come through, Galatians chapter 3, his seed. Not seeds meaning plural, but seed meaning one, a child that would come from the line of Abraham that would fulfill the promises of God and bring people into salvation through the cross. That's the story. That's the privilege you and I have. By faith, simply by you putting your faith in the story of Jesus, of his life, his death, his resurrection, so God gives you his spirit, and you and I could live by faith, and we are therefore declared children of God what a privilege so why then the law 
is the question that follows, okay? Why was the law added? Why do we have laws today? Well, don't be stupid. I'm speaking to the people that were asking the question, not you. Um, <laughs> Paul is saying, because of transgressions, I have this immense privilege to be part of the family, the clan of the Swanapools. But very early on in my life, I learned with that privilege came responsibility. With that privilege came the laying down of the law. With that privilege came, I don't care what people do in their homes, in our home we do it this way. Very early on, I learned that you could not go into mum's room when the door was closed. You knocked and waited for a response. And then when she allowed you into her bedroom, she had this beautiful thick uh, woven carpet. I still remember as a child being able to put my hand in it and do this at the door and then take my hand away and my handprint would be in the thick plush. I know modern day we don't talk about thick plush carpets anymore. That's gross, right? It's full of germs. Anyway, back, back then, that's what you could do, right? I knew from the outset that you could not step into that bedroom with shoes on, right? Because it was cream. It was beautiful. There were rules, rules that needed to be obeyed, right? Because it wasn't anarchy. Because that's what happens when there are no rules, right? Or have I got it wrong? There need to be rules, right? Or, or do we live in a modern society today where we can actually say, no, there, there, there are no restrictions, no rules. Just let every child develop as they see fit. Don't tell a child no. Don't tell a child stop. Just let them go, man. I mean, do you, do you honestly believe that is, that is a thing? Do we believe in our society that we can live that way? And we can get rid of all the rules and we would do the right thing. Yeah? No. And so that's the point of the law. God gave the law to Moses some 430 years later simply because they were the people of God. Because they had been rescued. And now they were going into the promised land. And in the promised land surrounding them were the tribes and the other nations of the world. And they had their own set of rules. And they were horrific to live under. They were barbaric to live under. Those kind of societies. And so what God does is he takes a nation and he puts them in the promised land and he says... You are my people living in my land. Now live my way. And he gives the law. And in that law itself, that they should live the way God intended them to live, that in itself is a signpost to the world to say, you've got it wrong. Come and see how we live. Come and see how we farm. Come and see how we look after our widows, our orphans, and our children. Come and see how we treat each other. Come and see how we worship our God. See that? As those laws are laid down, they, the laws in and of themselves are good laws. There's nothing wrong with the laws. What the law does is highlight your and my wickedness. The law in itself, if, it could, if, if, if the law could provide righteousness, it would. But it can't because what? You and I can't keep the law. It's not a problem with the law. It's the problem with you and I. It's the problem that we don't know how to live. And so, yeah, Jesus takes God's law, 480 laws or whatever they were, and don't get this in your mind that they were bad laws. They were not bad laws. They were good laws for the good of the people so that those people might be a blessing to the nations. And then he takes those laws and, God, and Jesus himself summarizes the law and says, here's the summary of God's law. Love God, love your neighbor. We seem to think 
when we become children of God and we've received this wonderful privilege because we've believed in Jesus Christ and the cross, that now no laws apply, that we have grace and freedom to do what we like. But that's just not true. While you wait for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, here's what you should do. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your strength, your soul. Love your neighbor as yourself. In actual fact, in two weeks' time, we'll look at it again where Paul actually says in Galatians uh, chapter 5, he says, this is the law you now live under. It's not the law of sin and death that you now live under. You now live under a law of the Spirit. And so live by the Spirit. And the only law that matters, Paul says, is love for one another. And then he expresses what that love looks like through the fruits of the Spirit. Patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, joy, you know, all of those. And so what Paul is doing in this particular chapter at this point in chapter 3 is he's saying to the people of God, understand the foundation. Here's the foundation. You have the privilege of being children of God. How did you become children of God? You heard the story about Jesus as Abraham heard the promises of God and you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, believed in that story. And so you were given the Spirit of God and you are now children of God by faith. And that's it. This is the beautiful thing about being a Swanapool is you can't disown me. I'm sorry for those families that have gone through those sort of things where you d disowning of children and stuff. My own son is not even living at home at the moment, but the other day he came home and said, Dad, give me a hug. And I was like, yep, let's have a hug. He's a swanapool. No matter what's going on in his life, I will never disown him. He has that privilege. But am I pleased with his behavior? No. Is my mum pleased with some of my behavior? No. Is God pleased with some of your behavior and my behavior? No. That's why we have the law. But in the midst of that, if you continue to live by faith alone, through grace alone, in the power of the Spirit alone, the Spirit that gives life, you are a child of God. You are sons and daughters of Abraham. The one covenant that was made, the promise that was made, that was ulti ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. God said to Abraham, I will give you land, I will give you descendants, and I will bless you. God says to you and me through the story of Jesus, I will give you land. Where's our home? Here on earth? No, in heaven. But God's promise is to restore heaven and earth to its former glory, land. God says, if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are my child. You and every person from every tribe, tongue, and nation of the world you become children of God, descendants, and blessing. There can be no greater blessing than being a child of God, filled with the Spirit of God, living in this world, loving the world, showing the blessings of God in the way you love the world and love each other, and living for the ultimate kingdom and our future glory. I am a child of God. If you believe the story about Jesus, you are a child of God. What a privilege. But with it comes a responsibility. And that responsibility is to love. I'll say more about that in a couple of weeks' time. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful promise you've given to us. We thank you that from the very beginning... You set this plan in motion. 
We thank you that we have the Old Testament and the New Testament that expresses that plan so beautifully to us. We can read history and we can see your hand through it all at every moment, every step. We thank you that history reaches its pinnacle in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for his life, his death, his resurrection. Thank you for his wonderful offer to all who believe that they will be called children of God. And that is what we are. What a privilege it is to call you Father. What a privilege it is to know that we are children. Children loved by you. Help us, Heavenly Father, through the power of your Spirit to be transformed. Help us not only to enjoy the privilege, but to understand the responsibility. The responsibility to love. Teach us through your Holy Spirit how we might love one another, serve one another, and be a blessing to all those around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.